Hello to the global community of IUCN and the World Commission for Protected Areas. We're very grateful to share with you uh, the new publication, the guidelines for conserving ecological connectivity uh, through ecological networks and corridors in this webinar as part of the road or journey to Marseille. I'm joined today uh, by the authors of the guidelines, which include Jody Hilty, lead author and deputy chair of the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, Stephen Woodley, who is the WCPA, or World Commission of Protected Areas, vice chair for science and biodiversity, Annika Keeley, who's a, a member of the WCPA Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, and lead author of the case studies, and myself, Gary Tabor, I serve as chair of the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. And we're very grateful that all of you, all 600 of you plus who have signed up for this webinar. Before we begin, just one technical housekeeping. We will, uh, at, we ask first of all, as is protocol on all Zoom calls, um, if uh, you're not speaking, including the panelists, please put yourself on mute, if not already. Some of you may have come in and, and are on mute because of the way we've moderated this. The second thing is, if you do have a question, put it in the chat. Now, if we have 600 people asking questions, we may not be able to answer all your questions, but we'll do the best we can, and I'll try to moderate those questions and hold all questions will, will occur at the end. And finally, um, uh, I just ask that uh, um, if there are internet difficulties, we cannot um, control for that and we'll do our best to motor on through anyone's uh, bandwidth issues as we go forward. As far as this, this is recorded, so let everyone know. If you have signed up through an email, you will get a link to the recording or the recording will be on IUCN's Vital Sites website and you can find a link there. So to begin, I'd like to introduce or uh, allow Stephen Woodley now to uh, start this webinar off and thank you all again for attending and being a part of the World Commission on Protected Areas and the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. Thank you, Stephen. So thanks, Gary, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for spending part of your day with us. Um, we're really excited about these guidelines. Uh, we're really excited about the reception they've received in the world. They're the, the in July they were the single largest download from all the IUCN uh, uh, publications. Um, we we hope we think that they're absolutely necessary uh, for conservation uh, on this planet. If uh, th this webinar, as Gary said, is part of the Vital Sites uh, program of the Journey to Marseille, and in Marseille, of course, is the location for the next World Conservation Congress, which is the global meeting of all IUCN uh, members. Uh, and given COVID, uh, we, we, there are a number of these Vital Sites uh, webinars as we, as we lead to the next uh, World Conservation Congress meeting. It, I guess if COVID has taught us anything that we live in a highly connected world. Um, and we, we know ecologically this, we're in a highly connected world. And these guidelines are all about dealing with what the World Economic Forum uh, regards as our two greatest challenges, climate change and biodiversity loss. And of course, they're, they're interrelated and uh, they, can, they can be addressed um, significantly by through ecological connectivity. This guidance is about establishing corridors between protected and conserved areas and, and leading to the development of conservation networks, uh, something that's been called been called for in the ecological literature for, for a long time and we hope this goes a long way to operationalizing it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the about IUCN. So if I could go to the next slide, please, Melissa. The IUCN puts out a whole range of, of guidance documents. Um, 
collectively the IUCN and its commissions are, are, are really the global standard setting uh, body for, for conservation. And they range from standards to guidance. So if you look on the left-hand side, uh, the definition of protected areas in the IUCN uh, and the categories associated with that, they're standards. They're standards because they were voted on at a conservation congress uh, by, by the membership and passed. Uh, the IUCN green list of protected and conserved areas is a standard because it was uh, voted on by IUCN council. Similarly, key biodiversity areas are a standard. On the far right, we have guidance documents. Um, how to measure ecosystem services, for example, is a new guidance document. How to adapt to climate change in protected areas is a guidance document. And in the middle, we have ones which are, they yes, they provide guidance, but they head towards being standards. There's a new one on other effective area-based conservation measures, or OECMs. Um, and this one on ecological connectivity fits right into that. We are, I think, moving towards a, a standard for ecological connectivity. Um, this is the first step uh, down that path. Uh, and it's taken a long time um, to get there. Uh, so we're really pleased that it's out. Next slide. The IUCN um, is composed, it's a membership-based organization. It's unique in the world. Most countries are members. Uh, and it has over 1,500 NGO members. That makes up a core membership. And around that membership are these, are these commissions. And these are voluntarily, volunteer expert commissions. They're of, in, across the six commissions, there's actually 15,000 uh, global experts. And so these, these documents would not occur, would not be developed without these commissions, without these, uh, the, the work of, of commissions and the, the organizations that make up the commissions. The World Commission on Protected Areas has 2,500 members in 140 countries. And the connectivity conservation guidance is, uh, is really a result of the work of these members in working in partnership with the Global Protected Areas Program, which is housed in the Secretariat of IUCN. Under the Commission on Protected Areas, we have task forces and specialist groups and the Connectivity Conservation uh, Specialist Group, which led on this, is one of those, uh, just to put it in context for the WCPA. I'm gonna turn it over to Gary Tabor now, who chairs the Connectivity Specialist Group, to talk about that and the, and the history of this organization. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. So the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group was born out of the mountain themes working group or specialist group for the World Commission on Protected Areas. But because we are no longer just in the mountains theme and because connectivity happens across all realms, freshwater, marine, coastal, and even in aerospaces, as well as terrestrial, the World Commission on Protected Areas created its own specialized group focusing on connectivity. We were established in Hawaii in 2016 at the World Conservation Congress there. And we are a community of scientific experts, conservation practitioners, policy people, as well as um, uh, leaders in other sectors and technical people in other sectors in conservation. Next slide. We have 920 plus members. We're growing in 119 countries around the world. So we are one of the larger specialist groups in the World Commission on Protected Areas. And I think that's a representation of the growth and interest in connectivity conservation. Next slide. And our role is to advance the science, the policy, and the practice of connectivity conservation, and to bring awareness of why connectivity matters as a conservation tool throughout the world. And in all languages, IUCN languages, we do this. And we believe that connectivity is the safety net of nature. Next slide. The group is so large, it also has some subspecialties. We have a group that focuses specifically on linear infrastructure. It's called the Transport Working Group. 
And there will be a companion document, hopefully in 2021, that's a technical series document that complements these guidelines that focuses specifically on the impacts of linear infrastructure and how we can avoid or mitigate these threats around the world. Next slide. We also have an emerging group looking at marine connectivity because marine protected areas are a major focus of the WCPA, but connectivity is an emerging area. And now there's a lot of conversation within the marine community of how we address connectivity because in fact, in the oceans connectivity is the fluid or the medium for how life works in that part of the world. Next slide. One of the first things we did in the connectivity conservation specialist group is to come up with a common definition of what connectivity is. Ecological connectivity is the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on earth. Jody will talk about this more in her presentation. But what this is, is that we wanted a simple definition, the definition for ecological electricity, if you will, that can be understood by policymakers all around the world. And we're grateful that con the conventional migratory species has adopted this definition. It's part of its pillar for the next its next strategic plan for the 2030, um, for its 2020 to 2030 strategic plan. Next slide. So these guidelines did not come out of nowhere. They've been built on the shoulders of a lot of people who have been carrying this idea forward for over two decades. And we wanna recognize all those who really laid the groundwork for what we're going to present today. Certainly Larry Hamilton, who was the chair of the Mountain Themes Group of the World Concert of the WCPA, the World Commission on Protected Areas. Larry, if, if none of you know him, he was a force of nature and none of this was possible without Larry. And his successor was Graham Warboys. And again, Graham really carried this rock up the hill and almost to the point of having guidelines, draft guidelines written by 2016. And we are grateful to both Larry and Graham, but there are others as well, like Andrew Bennett, who wrote one of the first um, guide, guide documents um, on connectivity conservation for IUCN called Linkages in the Landscape. Next slide. And there've been various uh, meetings of the World Commission on Protected Areas that have advanced this thought over years in different parts of the country, in different forms, both the legal aspect, the management aspects. Next slide. Leading to a resolution at the World Conservation Congress in 2016 that, that centrally laid out the need for having these guidelines more codified. And that's what we're gonna to present today. Next slide. Over the last three years, we, this is a global document. Over the last three years, we have worked with communities to have input into this document. This document was not written in isolation. It had a great deal of input. This is everybody's input. So you can imagine the work it's taken the authors to kind of combine and consolidate and synthesize all these inputs, all the languages into one document. So yes, it may not be the end all of connectivity conservation, but it is the end all of ha having everyone's input into the process. Next slide. So there are 16 core authors and we are all super grateful for the time that they took to put this together. I wanna to thank the authors on this call and certainly Jody Hilty for being our leader in this process. We had 38 case study authors we had over 150 individual reviews and consultations. So that's a peer review of 150 people. And then we had folks from 30 countries having input. So it is, you know, a broad range, broad supported document. Next slide. So with that, knowing that we have this history and we have this input, I'm going to allow uh, Jody Hilty now, who's the deputy chair of the uh, connectivity Conservation Specialist Group to lead us step-by-step step through the highlights of the guidelines. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Gary. And thank you everyone for being here. It's really fun to see names of people I know. Um, and uh, guidelines only work if people use them and if people share them, if governments use them. So really excited to get to talk to you a little bit about what's in them 
and why we created them. So at the highest level, obviously we're looking to push forward connectivity conservation. Uh, there are sort of three general parts, if you will, in this report. One is something that's not really new, the consolidation of a wealth of knowledge and, and the best practices uh, for connectivity conservation. Um, but you need to have that in order to move forward on the other two. What's really new that other documents don't have is we are, we are basically saying this is what a conserved ecological corridor is. You have to check the boxes of, you know, what is it, what, 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 is, ha what is required in order to actually call it a conserved corridor. And the third thing is we're working with the World Database on Protected Areas to make sure that conserved corridors get into a database so that we can go from sort of measuring whether the world is connected, but not knowing if those connectivity areas are secure, to actually knowing where we have secured connectivity for now and into the future. The next slide, please. So um, I'm going to breeze through the beginning because, like I said, this isn't so new, but obviously we had to establish um, clarity on why we need connectivity. And there are all these reasons. There's, uh, you know, an extinction crisis. We have humans and human activities expanding around the globe and climate change. And we know that while protected areas are really important, that they're not sufficient for stemming the loss of biodiversity. And so we have to think about how to move from protected areas to large landscape connectivity through ecological networks. Next slide, please. And, um, and there's a lot of science that really backs this up. And again, I'm not gonna go into it, but we know that protected areas that are isolated are likely to lose species and processes. And there's uh, a lot of scientific theory that backs this up and talks about the importance of connectivity, particularly during this time of climate change. Next slide. So one of the things that we've seen since we've globally settled on a definition of protected areas and the need for biodiversity conservation is this incredible increase of protected areas around the world. And now we're also seeing OECMs or other effective area-based conservation measures increasing. Um, however, when we look at connectivity, we're doing less well. So there was a recent paper that said basically somewhere between 9 and 12 percent of protected areas and OECMs are connected. But that doesn't even mean that that connectivity is secure. Um, and in the marine world, we haven't even been able to measure whether or not that connectivity exists. Next slide. So one of the things that we needed to do, because we're working across all the different realms, was ensure that we have a common language. Next slide. So I'm just going to highlight a few areas of why that's important. Gary shared how uh, the IUCN Connectivity Specialist Group and the United Nations Convention for Migratory Species came to an agreement on a high-level definition. Um, and that's the one shown in the left-hand corner. It's something that um, for non-scientists, it works um, and it's understandable. However, remember, this is a document for everyone. And so what we needed to do um, to satisfy everyone was also provide that scientific uh, uh, definition with genes and propagules and all those things that um, non-scientists maybe don't appreciate as much, but to make sure that there's this higher level definition and then there's a science level definition um, that sort of supports that. Next slide. One of the things that was a challenge for us at the beginning um, in the connectivity specialist group is many people said, hey, we have protected areas, we have this thing called OECMs, um, and why can't we achieve connectivity through them? Um, and so there were a lot of global debates about this, and what we had to do is be really clear that Ecological corridors are what are between protected areas and OECMs. Um, and that unlike protected areas and OECMs that have to conserve biodiversity, ecological corridors may or may not conserve biodiversity. And whereas protected areas and OECMs can sometimes conserve connectivity, oftentimes they don't. Um, maybe there's a migratory species that's moving in and out of that protected area. Um, and so it's not uh, necessarily achieving connectivity. So we do need this sort of third leg of the stool. Next slide, please. 
So um, in order to sort of frame what corridors were, we needed to talk about what is this architecture for large scale conservation. And there's been a lot of discussion in the ecological literature about these ecological networks. So I really like this map of Western Thailand, which really shows it all. There's sort of the green protected areas, then there's a sanctuary that's in sort of skin color. And you can see that square is outlining this area where there's no hunting, um, which and um, uh, in this pink area. And these, the pink area is really the connectivity between these other pieces. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it's about making sure that we get to the scale that nature needs to, to sustain species and ecological processes. Next slide. And so we actually define um, ecological network, you know, to include um, the new definition of OECMs, protected areas, as well as ecological corridors. Next slide. And um, this is just sort of a, what I would call a chaotic representation of, of ecological networks. It tries to sort of reflect a little bit of reality where the green and blue areas are those protected areas, the brown areas are OECMs, and then the dotted lines, which sometimes are continuous and sometimes are discontinuous, represent those ecological corridors. So ecological corridors can be continuous or they can be stepping stones, depending on the needs um, that, uh, and what you're trying to conserve for the long term. Next slide, please. So here's where we really get into the meat of what's new in, in ecological corridors. Um, in this chapter, what we're really doing, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to say that we define that if you're, if, if you're, if you're saying that this place is an ecological corridor, what does it need to do? Where is it? So in the sciences, we often talk about, oh, the matrix needs to be permeable. Well, that's great, but the, we, can't, we can't ensure that, um, that nothing changes across an, an indefinite, immeasurable matrix. So where does the connectivity need to happen? For what? How is it going to be governed so that it, it is conserving whatever the connectivity needs are for now and in the future? And how are we monitoring and evaluating it over the long term. Next slide. So I'm gonna just remind you that ecological quarters are not a substitute for protected areas and OECMs, and they don't include them. And in some places like really intact boreal forests in Northern Canada, they're intact right now. Maybe the goal there is protected areas and establishing those. But in most of the world that is, has a huge human footprint, we're looking at either maintaining or restoring connectivity. So what needs to happen there? Um, and and um, really being clear on what are the connectivity objectives? Are we trying to maintain flowing rivers? Are we trying to maintain uh, propagules that can flow across time and space to different marine protected areas? Are we trying to maintain migration corridors or just a larger metapopulation of species over time? And if, regardless of that, how are we governing and managing this for the long term? Next slide. So ecological corridors can be natural, natural areas, um, um, but they also might have uh, human uses. And the key is to define if there are human uses, what kind of human uses are compatible. Um, and it might be a time limited piece, or it might be different kinds of human activities that are compatible and incompatible, those need to be defined um, uh, so that over the long term, this corridor or an identified corridor can continue to function. Next slide, please. We recognize that probably in the ideal um, corridor legislation could go forward at national level levels as well as subnational levels, but that takes a long time. And so in this document, we also talked about other kinds of mechanisms that can work to get us to long-term conserved corridors. And uh, this slide just offers a few of those different approaches that can move us down the road towards conserved corridors. Next slide. Um, and we also talk about like protected areas, corridors need, ecological corridors need to work across marine, freshwater, and terrestrial environments 
as well as airspaces, although there wasn't enough research for us to really define airspace connectivity. So that's an area that is still under development. Next slide. And I think the important thing here is not only is it within each of these realms, but also it's across realms because so many times we might have a marine protected area or a terrestrial protected area with a gap in between, but the reality is species and ecological processes are flowing between those. And so we also need to think about those mixed environments. Next slide. So moving really well beyond the science into sort of uh, law and policy, there are a lot of calls for connectivity already in place and there's already legislation moving forward. Our purpose is to try to ensure that as that, that practice of law and policy continues, that it's actually using the best available information and we're seeing global consistency like we are on protected areas. Next slide. So there, are, this is just an example of places that are calling for the need for connectivity, like in the IEG uh, biodiversity targets. Um, I really like that the World Business Council, which is 500 or more industries, um, call to action for landscape connectivity. And there are also other laws and policies that are calling out the need for ecological corridors and connectivity. Next slide. And we would argue that when you look at this whole list of international instruments and bodies, that in order to actually achieve many of these, we need the tool of ecological corridors and ecological networks. Next slide, please. I think one of the things that's really exciting for me is to see that around the world, we're starting to see countries and even subregions moving forward in the development of laws around, um, around ecological corridors. Um, I love this map of Bhutan where they've conserved 53% of their, um, their country for nature conservation and those green areas you can see are, are the already identified and conserved ecological corridors. These other countries listed are also moving forward in this, in this space as well. And there's, um, there's other countries and also subregions that are advancing. One of the things that we're trying to do is to ensure that as this kind of uh, legislation moves forward and these policies advance, that they're um, really doing it in the most robust way. And so our hope is that um, we all together, all of you on this phone call and beyond, will be supporting governments and policymakers to use this, this document as a frame. Next slide. Um, the last thing that I'll say around um, around this is, is repeating a little bit, but it's important. Today, we have no idea where on a global basis we have con effectively conserved corridors. For us to be effective as a global community in conserving biodiversity, we think that we, we need to figure that out just like there is this global data, database on protected areas. And so we are working with a protected area planet to um, develop the equivalent for ecological corridors so that we can actually begin to track not what level of connectivity is left in the world, but what level of connectivity have we actually conserved or are we in the act of restoring? So I'm particularly excited about that piece. Next slide. So this is where I will read to you the 450 references. Just kidding, um, next slide. Um, so I just want to recap that this ecological corridors are really important uh, for all the different realms and across the realms if we want to conserve biodiversity and the science really supports this. Um, it, you know, connectivity conservation is key for really helping ensure that protected areas and OECMs conserve biodiversity um, and, and the linking of protected areas and OECMs is fundamental. I'm thrilled that there's a lot of work going on around connectivity. We're seeing new projects and programs around landscape conservation, seascape conservation popping up. And our goal here is to ensure that these guidelines help to make all of that work the very best it can be. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Annika 
who's going to uh, introduce the case studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. So this compendium of 25 case studies illustrates initiatives around the world that are working towards protecting or restoring ecological connectivity. You can see here on the map, they are really nicely distributed. We have authors from around the world. Um, the case studies offer insight into the breadth of approaches being used to advance conservation of ecological corridors. And these corridors are benefiting ecological networks in the terrestrial, freshwater, or marine realm. Next slide. Each case study describes the context and challenges of connectivity in the study region, explains the approach to conservation, presents an example of an ecological corridor in the network, and shares some results. Um, there's also a key lesson learned from the project. Um, the case studies were selected to demonstrate a variety of ecological networks for conservation and ecological corridors within them and a variety of approaches to their conservation. And um, these examples, um, I believe, can really help us understand both the diversity of current efforts and the need uh, to move toward formalizing ecological corridors as elements of ecological networks for conservation. Um, you will hear from four case study authors in more detail after my presentation, but I want to give you just three um, examples of projects and the key lessons learned to illustrate the diversity of case studies that are included in this guidelines document. Uh, next slide. The first example is the Great Eastern Ranges, um, which is Australia's first, con first continental scale ecological network for conservation. And the key lesson here is that a bold mission to protect, restore, and relink habitat to allow uh, nature and people to continue to thrive despite changing clim climatic conditions can lead to engagement of many parts of society and on-ground conservation activities. The second example, next slide please, um, is the Spanish National Network of Drovas Roads, also called Vias Pecuarias. Um, this is a transportation network originally established for moving livestock, which now provides ecological connectivity among protected areas, especially where restored for that function. You can see here in the pictures that um, it's a really, it's a network of old roads um, with protected lands on both sides of these roads. And they're still being used for um, livestock, but also for many other purposes now, including ecological connectivity. And then next slide, please. And the third example is about grassroots reserves in the Salween River Basin in Thailand that have strong benefits for river ecosystems. River ecosystems. The key lesson from this project is that recognition and enforcement of river reserves by the local communities, which benefit local fisheries and enhance the health of the river, the river system, is a significant first step to increasing in-stream connectivity. So great diversity of, of um, case studies, and we're going to hear from four more um, Ankuta Fedorka from Romania will now talk about the case study she wrote for the guidelines document. Thank you so much, Anika. Thank you for, uh, very much for your participation. It's great to see so many participants. I, I want to say that uh, my case study is fortunate enough to have the highest biodiversity in Europe, actually and holds the biggest continuous forest ecosystems in Europe with natural habitats which are very well preserved. It's a biodiversity hotspot and it's situated at the crossroads of important biogeographic regions. It's more, it's, uh, it's very important to say that uh, holds the largest populations of large carnivores in Europe. Of course, we do have threats, and the immediate one is that there are challenges in land ownership and also into the infrastructure development, not only on the linear infrastructure, but also in the household and, and other kind of, of developing. Almost 30% of the national territory is covered by forest, which includes virgin and also ancient beach forests. 
and 24% of the country was included into the Natura 2000 network. However, as it is the situation almost in all the countries across Europe, the sites are spatially disconnected. In figure one, you can see the protected areas coverage across the, the country and you can see very well that there are some areas which are connected, but most of them are disconnected. Next, please. One of the first initiatives on connectivity conservation, which were focusing on national scale, was Core Hubs and consisted initially in two public universities, one national research institute and three NGOs. The Core Hubs initiative was aiming to create decision support tools for stakeholders and to, mitigate the, to help mitigate in the infrastructure development. In 2017, the initiative was extended into a European consortium focusing on BEARS, which was aiming to investigate the functional connectivity and ecological sustainability of the BEARS across Europe, and this was including also Romania. In terms of the legislative context, the Romanian legislation mandates the protection of connectivity by designing ecological corridors on field in Ford modeling and empirical val validation. According to the legislation, it's very important to highlight that the protected areas and ecological corridors should be integrated into local, regional, and national planning in cadastral plans and land registers, which offers a very good frameworks, a framework in terms of the legislative implementation. Anyway, uh, this, uh, this moment we are actually missing a procedural designation, which is in, uh, in working together with the Ministry of Environment. The case, uh, next please. The case study presented in figure two represents an area which is extremely diverse in terms of connectivity, species management and infrastructure development. The dark green represents the ecological corridors with the highest probability for multi-species movement, which were then validated both structural and functional. The ecological network comprises one national park, one natural park, three protected areas, and three ecological corridors. As you can see, there are lots of mortalities along the existing infrastructure and even more, a future highway is planned to bisect the area for the first time. The area is a focal center also for human bears conflicts and is the most visited area in the country, which puts a lot of pressure on the network. However, we had a very important workshop last November in, uh, in Brasov organized by the Center for Large Landscape Conservation together with the IUCN, BearConnect Consortium and CoreHabs and other stakeholders. And we tested uh, a more extended area comprising also other corridors to see how are the guidelines which are discussing about it today working on, uh, on the ground actually. And it was a successful workshop because we do have specific measures. We identified particularities, corridors which are working and which are not valid anymore, or uh, areas which, in which we need to focus more on our connectivity conservation measures. Next, please. The overall results of the case study could be summarized as follows. Core Hubs develop mechanisms for identification and assessment of the ecological corridors and even more has ensured training for 250 specialists across the country. BearConnect has ensured mechanisms for validating functional connectivity and for mapping ecological corridors and uh, we also uh, designed a stakeholder decision tool and uh, this is very important. Our country, of course, even if we do still have more to achieve, we are on good track to protect the ecological network of protected areas and ecological corridor. And as a result of the workshop in which we had almost 50 participants from over 13 countries across Europe and across the, the world, uh, 
um, we, we are proud to say that we advanced and the uh, Ministry of Environment is aiming to create the National Committee for uh, Connectivity Conservation in which will be uh, NGOs, uh, research institutes, universities and so on. I am uh, very proud to present this to you and I am very thankful for giving me this opportunity and many thanks to leading authors and Annika and all of you. Thank you so much, Ankura. Um, next up is Cesar Suarez and he will talk about the protection of the free-flowing Beta River in Colombia. Yes, uh, good, good day for everyone. Uh, I'm Cesar Suarez, I'm working with WWF Colombia and this case study was write, uh, was written by, by my colleagues uh, Saulo Usma from, from Colombia, Michel Tim from the US team and Fernando Trujillo who is the scientific director of the Omacha Foundation. Next please. So the, the river, the Vita River are located in the east of Colombia in border with Venezuela and the waters uh, goes to the directly to the Orinoco River Basin. It ha, uh, the Vita has a, a length of 520 kilometers and the, the catchment area has more than a, a, a 800,000 hectares. So in this area, some gap analysis have identified key areas to, to protect, to conservation. And in fact, the lowland area are part of the El Tuparro uh, Biosphere Reserve. So our question was how to protect, how to conserve all this uh, river basin, how to connect all the important areas for conservation. And uh, our, our approach was, well, try to, to, to engage all, all the institutions, all local, national, regional, local governments to, um, uh, to, to try to, to understand the, the conflicts and the opportunities to uh, uh, maintain the ecological flows of, along the river. So next, please. Our approach, uh, I, this timeline is, 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 is long, but uh, I only want to highlight uh, 2014 year uh, where the Protective River Alliance was created. This alliance was led uh, in the first step, uh, step by the Humboldt Institute, but with um, the, the particip participation of the regional government local ONGs, national ONGs, as we, we will see in, in, the next, in the next slide. So, so uh, with this alliance, we compile previous uh, information that during different initiatives was carried out. Uh, for instance, and since 1995 uh, was characterized the, the dolphin um, population in this river. And um, as you can see, different species was um, part of the study uh, along the river. So we identify gaps and with the Alliance, we fill the gaps and in 2018, we um, using um, system dynamic analysis, we create different conservation scenarios and uh, we produce some suggestions to the national government to design as the Ramsar site uh, for all the river basin, include the catchment areas. So in August 2018, uh, the, the national government designed a Ramsar site uh, for all the, the river basin. And now uh, we are working in the, in the formulation and impl implementation management plan. Next slide, please. So here is, is, is the participation of many institutions along, uh, along the, the pro this process. No? In the first line, you can see the, the national and the governmental level, the in, in head of the environmental uh, ministry, the regional environmental authority who is Corporate Nokia, and UNAP who is the fisheries, uh, the national fisheries authority. In the second row, you can see the logos of different uh, institutions that were part of the, of the alliance to protect the river. And uh, 
in the other rows, you can see an important institutions that uh, have uh, supported this, uh, this initiative during different years. And of course, the local forest sector, fishing and tourists that have been part of the discussions to identify the better way to protect all the, the, this, this system, this ecological uh, uh, corridor that is the, all the river. No, next. And now, uh, now we are trying to, to, um, to articulate different uh, tools or instruments, no? So here we have the international um, tool that this is the Ramsar Management Plan uh, that should be articulated with the PONCA. The PONCA in Colombia is the, the River Basin Management Plan led by the Regional Environmental Authority and of course, uh, in conjunction with the fisheries management plan, the, the fisheries management plan um, are led by, by the, the fisheries authority, but in articulation with all the stakeholders that we, we can find along the river. And in complementary, uh, there is uh, some particular um, conservation actions that we are trying to to, um, to push uh, with the civil society natural reserves and with local farmers to identify um, areas to, to preserve. And uh, we have defined an, an, uh, along the river some uh, key areas as a core areas to protect uh, this corridor uh, along the river. No, next please. So, uh, some results that we have achieved during uh, the last two years after the Ramsar site, Ramsar site designation uh, uh, are at the same time our, our challenge for future and our challenge to consolidate and maintain the free flowing river. So one is, is the Ramsar site consolidation. So uh, in articulation with, with the all, all other instruments as I, I, as I mentioned before, uh, the uh, the, 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 the predial and management plan of these uh, uh, natural reserves that are into the, the river uh, or along the river, um, at the same time, build capacity to avoid uh, the conflict between felines and cattle rancher activities, uh, that this is an, a constant uh, problem in, in this area. Uh, at the same time, to, to define core areas of conservation to maintain key uh, species populations as um, uh, tapir, uh, jaguar, puma, uh, other um, um, our turtles, well, many, many species that we can find along the river. And of course, the prevention and control of uh, fires uh, that are very, uh, this is a problem during the dry season. So it is our, our results that the, at this moment we have, but as, as I say, is our challenge for future, no? To maintain all the, all the river in a good state and a free flow. Thanks. Thank you so much, Cesar. Um, next up is Will White, and he's going to talk about the Northern Channel Islands connectivity across a network of marine protected areas contributes to positive population and ecosystem consequences. Great, thank you very much. So to set the stage for this particular conservation story, we're now working in a marine environment, a coastal uh, a marine ecosystem that's offshore of a huge population center near Los Angeles, California. And so this is a, a temperate ecosystem that's uh, a prime, where the primary uh, habitat we're concerned with is kelp forests. So these are uh, marine forests. They're fed by cold, nutrient-rich upwelled waters, and they support a hugely biodiverse uh, uh, ecosystem of fishes and invertebrates. And there are a variety of ecosystem services provided here. So there's fisheries that support a, a local economy. There's a lot of ecotourism, primarily scuba diving and whale watching, things like that. And then we also have a huge uh, suite of cultural values, both uh, for indigenous peoples who have treaty rights to have access to these, these habitats uh, and to the uh, modern day uh, population of, of California, which is of course uh, uh, 
uh, very large and uh, there are a variety of both recreational and commercial uses of these, of these habitats. There are uh, then a variety of human impacts on this, these ecosystems ranging from overfishing, which was uh, a large problem in the 1990s and 1980s, less so now in this particular habitat. Uh, but increasingly, there are uh, challenges faced with invasive species and climate change in these habitats. Next slide. So uh, the map I'm showing you now is of the Channel Islands. This is, these are uh, five islands off the coast of uh, Santa Barbara, California. If you can imagine the, the map of California there, uh, Los Angeles is just to the right of the box that I'm showing you, so just, just to the east as a, as a touchstone. Um, and so these are offshore islands, but they're easily accessible by boats from the mainland. And uh, in the 1990s, there were a lot of concerns among conservation groups and local citizens about declines in the populations of uh, many of the fishes and invertebrates that were uh, harvested off the coasts here. And also concerns about increasing stressors uh, from climate on the kelp forests themselves. So El Nino events bring warm waters into these uh, cold water systems and are uh, very damaging to the kelp forests there. It can cause the loss of the kelp habitat. So in 1998, uh, a coalition of fishers and managers and uh, uh, concerned citizens approached the controlling legal authority in this region, uh, the California Fish and Game Commission, to provide increased protections in the Northern Channel Islands. And so as a result of, of that public pressure and the collaboration between both fishers and conservation uh, conservation oriented citizens, uh, in 2003, the state of California and a federal agency, the, the Channel Islands National Park, uh, created 13 national, uh, 13 marine protected areas in the system. And so in the map, you can see the, these protected areas. Uh, and, and there are a variety of overlapping jurisdictions in this area. So th those are indicated by the different uh, colored lines in the area. So uh, the, the outer black line indicates a federal designation, so a United States level designation of a national marine sanctuary, which indicates an uh, area that is of special interest, but doesn't necessarily have any uh, regula regulations that come along with that. The inner blue line are the California state waters, where the state of California can regulate fishing effort. Um, and then you have a national park, that's the green line surrounding that, which is primarily oriented towards the terrestrial system here, not so much the, the marine system. And so the protected areas that were initially placed are the solid colored ones, the ones that are in red and blue, and so the, the red areas are places that are marine reserves, which means that they do not have any take of any living species from kelp to invertebrates to fishes. The, uh, the blue areas are places where there is protection for some species, but not all species. Uh, later <clears throat> in 2007, the uh, federal agency, the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, extended those MPAs beyond state waters into uh, all the way up to the federal waters. And so that's indicated by the, the hashed lines there. So it's been a gradual establishment process. And that expansion was really important from a connectivity and corridor perspective in the sense that many of the species that live close to shore also uh, move further offshore at times and move into deeper habitats. And so now the, the full range of depths used by many of the species is totally protected. Uh, next slide, please. An important distinguishing characteristic that's different from some of the other case studies you've heard before is that at the time that these protected areas were put into place, they were not thought of or not studied as a network with connectivity per se. And that's really a feature of the state of the science at the time where it was essentially impossible to effectively measure connectivity of many marine species uh, just from a technical standpoint. And that's because most of the species of interest from things like lobsters to abalone to uh, kelp forest fishes have adults, the, an adult stage that lives in the kelp forest. But when they reproduce, they produce these tiny microscopic larvae, which leave the kelp forest and are dispersed on uh, ocean currents. And you, you cannot tag these, <laughs> these small uh, larvae and you can't visualize where they're going. And when they eventually come back to the kelp forest habitat to enter the adult population after days or weeks or months, or in some case, many months in the case of lobsters, it's impossible to tell where they came from. And so there's been a lot of uncertainty over the years 
about how well different populations are connected. And that, that's why the, uh, the a goal of that protected area was to have enough individual protected areas that it was likely that there would be connections between them in that larval stage, um, but it was impossible to know how much there was. Now, in the subsequent years, there's been a lot of research devoted to that, and we now have a better understanding of how well these protected areas are connected by a network. Uh, there are a few different ways you can measure this. The, the most direct empirical way is through essentially uh, DNA parentage analysis. So if you're able to collect samples of adults in different habitats and juveniles in different habitats, you can match them up. Um, unfortunately, the populations of these uh, organisms are so large that the effort required to really detect reliable estimates of connectivity uh, via that method is, is challenging and, and very limited at this time. Um, and so uh, where the current state of the science is, is to use predictive computer models to understand how ocean currents carry these larvae. And so we have uh, models that represent the physical currents uh, in this system. And so these are large uh, 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 numerical models of the way ocean currents evolve over time, um, driven by observations of uh, wind and uh, currents on buoys and coastal radars and things like that. So they're data-fed predictive models of the ocean currents. And essentially, the scientists who study this uh, simulate the movement of fish or invertebrate larvae on those ocean currents. And so they can, they can simulate the release of larvae from one protected area, where those larvae would go and where they would land and obtain a probability of the connection between different uh, habitats. And so that's what's shown in this map here. So this is a, the broader Southern California Bight. The Northern Channel Islands that I showed you a map of earlier are in the upper left-hand corner of that, of that map. But you can see there's other uh, island habitats in this broader system. And of course, there's, there's the mainland habitat as well. And so this is the domain of these uh, computer simulation models. What's shown in, in the map is just one example of the type of computations that can be done. And so if you simulate the release of these virtual larvae from one location, and so Site 83 is in a protected area on the northern coast of Santa Cruz Island, the intensity of the color shows the probability of larvae leaving that one site and going to other sites in the network. And so the cooler colors uh, to the eastern part of this region have a lower chance of being connected to that site. The warmer colors elsewhere in those Channel Islands have a high probability of being connected. And so we've learned from this type of investigation that there are likely very strong linkages in connectivity between those different protected areas and that they are operating as a network. So there's ongoing work in the system to understand how the protected areas are linked using models like this linked to population surveys so we can understand how ch different changes in the adult populations in those locations are leading to differences in the number of larvae being produced and the, the strengths of those connections. Uh, and also how the system is working together as a network uh, that is uh, connected and thus leading to an overall increase in the number of fish in each node in the network and also in the fished areas outside, which is of course of great interest to the fishers who have stakes in this in the system. Um, and how that, that network effect is perhaps leading to a, uh, a whole is more than the, the sum of its parts sort of effect where each system is, each protected area isn't just working on its own. Uh, next slide, please. So these areas have been protected in MPAs for almost two decades now, actually. And of course, there's ongoing assessment of how well those protected areas are performing in terms of the increases in the biomass of targeted fish species. So by target, I mean species that would be fished otherwise. So both kelp forest fishes and lobsters uh, and sea urchins as well are all harvested species in the system. Um, this is a, because it's a temperate system, uh, unlike many coral reef systems that have uh, rapid increases in fish biomass inside of protected areas, the system is really driven by uh, big swings from year to year in the number of larvae that survive that, uh, that connection journey and uh, arrive in protected areas and contribute to the adult populations there. And so there's been a lot of variability in the trajectory of populations increasing uh, after their protection over the past 17 years. But uh, there has been a steady increase in biomass inside those protected areas, uh, particularly for, for species that are, um, are uh, otherwise targeted by fisheries. And we now have evidence that, um, that some of the fishing effort 
that has left the protected areas has likely been transferred to the harvested areas. And so we have a, a big disparity in um, the level of harvesting that's happening in these locations. Um, some of the evidence of the broader uh, ecosystem services provided by the system are that older protected areas in the system have resisted the invasion of a non-native macroalgae that's been moving up from, uh, from warmer waters and invading the system. Essentially, the protected areas, because they protect large uh, <clears throat> excuse me, because they protect um, the large fish and uh, lobsters that feed on the urchins that otherwise feed on kelp, there is higher kelp biomass inside those protected areas. And that higher kelp biomass is able to resist the invasion of this non-native macroalgae, uh, sargassum, that in unprotected areas is able to outcompete the degraded kelp habitats. So there's evidence not only of uh, fished species being protected, but that leading to broader ecosystem consequences in this network. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Um, and last but not least, um, Andrew Nambota will talk about connectivity conservation in the Sambesi Chobe floodplain. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, to make a, present, a presentation uh, on connectivity conservation in Kaza, uh, the Zambezi Chobe floodplain wildlife special area. I'm uh, Andrew Nambota, uh, regional manager at uh, Northern TFCAs uh, based in Zambia. Next slide, please. I am going to talk to you about the Kavango Zambes Transfrontier Conservation Area. Uh, the Kavango Zambes Transfrontier Conservation Area was established in 2011, and this was an initiative of five countries Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. It is about 520,000 square kilometers. In size, almost the size of France. Each of these countries, each of the five countries, developed what we call an integrated development plan uh, to indicate how the national development plans will link across the various borders. As a result of this, we came up uh, with a master integrated development plan which was created uh, shortly after the development of the integrated development, the national integrated development plans. This master integrated development plan uh, identified six transboundary uh, wildlife dispersal areas in the Kaza, namely the Zambezi Chove floodplain, Wange Kazuma floodplain, you know, uh, Chove uh, WDA, Kwandu WDA, Zambezi Musotunya WDA, Wange Magadgadi Sai uh, WDA, and then Kaudum and Gamiland WDA. But for the, this case study was conducted in the Zambezi Chove flood plain. Uh, next slide, please. To make Ikaza work, it was very, very necessary uh, to connect formal protected areas through these corridors or WDAs. You will recall that uh, just in Kaza, we have 250,000 elephants, which is almost half of the African elephants on, in the world. And out of these 100, uh, out of these 250,000 uh, elephants, 150 of them are all in the Chove landscape. So to facilitate the movement of elephants from the Chove National Park to other parks, one of the initiatives was to create the Zambezi or to establish the Zambezi Chove floodplain 
WGA. So this is a crucial link between uh, the Chobe National Park in Botswana through the conservancies uh, in uh, the Zambezi region of Namibia to the Kafue National Park in Zambia. The map there shows uh, the various uh, WDAs, but we are just going to concentrate on the Chobe Zambezi uh, WDA. Next slide. Next slide, please. In the Chove WDA, we have uh, three major uh, uh, areas. We have the Chove floods, flood plain, uh, flood plains. We have the uh, in, in, in that's in Botswana, and then we have the uh, conservancies in the eastern. Uh, or the Zambezi region of Kapuvi, or of uh, you know Namibia, and then we have the smaller communities. Now this case study actually concentrated more on the uh, smaller community conservancy, and this is a, a, a communal area which cuts across two chiefdoms, namely the Sesheke chiefdom, which is uh, you know. <clears throat> headed by senior chief Inyamboyeta, and the Sekute chieftain, which is uh, headed by chieftainess uh, Sekute. A, com a community conservancy was formed, or was established in 2012 by the two chiefs with the assistance or facilitation of this Pats Foundation. This conservancy was created to establish the WDA, the Chove Zambezi WDA, but also created to benefit the communities that live in there. To ensure transparency and efficient management of the conservancy, we formed what we call the Smalaha Community Trust. Next slide, please. Now, it is uh, not easy to start talking to people that are hungry to talk to them about uh, conservation. So we had to come up with the uh, alternative livelihoods. We had to ensure that uh, you know, the people that we are talking to were food secure. We had to ensure that the people that we're talking to uh, were going about their business uh, in a normal way, not on an empty stomach. They were able to send their children to school and do their normal errands. So we had to look at the existing uh, institutional frameworks. We didn't want to reestablish the way. So we engaged uh, the traditional institutional frameworks that was, were existing in the area and uh, you know, uh, made them have you know uh, an insight of our vision. We had to have a shared vision if this connectivity was going to work or to be conserved. So after planning together with the communities, with their leaders, senior chief Nyamboyeta and chief Nesikute, and their you know traditional setups, we came up with a, a roadmap. And the roadmap that we came up with, one was that of creating a wildlife economy. And how do we do that? We had to, you know, we decided to reintroduce wildlife into the area. Now, why introduce wildlife into the area? The, although the, we still had the, the active, you know, the, the WDA was still active. There were very, very few animals that were passing through. And in each case, whenever the animals passed through, uh, the communities would help themselves. So we had to engage them, create awareness, the need and the importance of uh, you know, having these uh, wildlife dispersal areas active. But even if they were to be active, if the people saw no benefit in them, it was going to be difficult for them to 
come and buy. And this is why we came up with the alternative livelihoods to ensure that the people were food secure. We came up with activities that uh, sort of, uh, you know, would enable them uh, make some little income from their activities. So we had to um, introduce a number of activities such as smart agriculture. We had to introduce um, varieties, seed varieties that were, you know, uh, appropriate, you know, to that area, uh, you know, for the landscape. We had to introduce seed varieties that were, you know, um, uh, climate uh, or uh, you know, drought resistant because that area is uh, drought prone. You know, drought prone. We had to come up with uh, varieties of uh, crops that would grow well. So we had to base our interventions on science so that we don't fail. So we did that, and then we said, look, for us to introduce uh, animals in your area, in this area, we have to have people that will look after. So as a result, we had to train twenty village scouts, their own children. They made their own uh, choices and decided who should, be, who should go for you know, training. So we got village you know, uh, scouts trained. Yeah? And because of this ownership of the program, even after we had introduced the animals into the areas, we have had very, actually one, just one incident of uh, uh, poaching. So we came up with quite a number of uh, activities. Uh, we looked at schools because we know that the future, as peacefulness, we believe that the future of conservation belongs to you know, uh, the communities and their children. Because uh, without education, again, without their children going to school, it would be very, very difficult. So we have introduced uh, education programs in schools. Uh, that sort of, uh, you know, from an early age, you know, um, expose the school children uh, to, you know, uh, conservation uh, initiatives and also to conservation advantages. Yeah. So that is very, very, you know, that has gone very, very well. We have in the process also introduced uh, energy saving stocks so that, you know, the indiscriminate cutting down of trees, um, you know, should stop or should be minimized. But at the same time, uh, we have linked the energy, you know, uh, uh, saving stocks to, uh, you know, carbon credits. So, you know, if there was time, we're going to elaborate on that. But we have also come up with, uh, you know, other, you know, initiatives such as, uh, you know, heading for health, where we, you know, uh, teach people how to, uh, you know, look after their animals better. This is a, a cattle rearing. Uh, you know, area, and therefore, you know, this, you know, such programs were well, uh, were well received because they also came from the, you know, the communities themselves. So that as a, something that is very, very important in their life. And then, uh, you know, we have taught people how to do, you know, range, uh, rangeland uh, management, yeah, uh, so that uh, you know they practice, you know, uh, rotation of uh, you know say you know crop rotation yeah and also you know they are able to uh, manage their uh, land uh, better next slide please next slide please yeah so uh, the benefits are there for everyone to see and uh, you know for those that will visit us one day in smala they will find that actually our villages our communities are now able to grow food throughout the year so uh, they are able to make money you know, from their activities, which we have uh, introduced. And because we introduced these uh, activities, we came up with them in the conjunction with the communities, they, are, they were very easy to follow. Yeah, so the, the benefits are there. These people now are able to make money throughout the year. They are able to send their you know, children to, to school. We have even come up with, uh, you know, uh, fish manage, management, uh, you know, uh, activities. Yeah, and this we are doing not only on the Zambian side, but in conjunction with the, uh, the conservancies you know, across the, the Zambezi River in Namibia. So we have planned the, the, <clears throat> the fishing uh, zone or the fishery zone uh, in such a way that we have breeding sites and we have areas where we can utilize uh, the fish jointly. They are together with the communities. So really, um, uh, this is a program that uh, has a lot of impact. 
we have introduced uh, tree drop palms, and those are the ones they are using for their gardens throughout the, the year. Children now have, uh, you know, some of the schools we have, in some of the schools we have introduced, uh, you know, computers. In two schools we have even introduced uh, computer labs, not just teachers and, uh, you know, the class that is having uh, lessons, uh, you know, having a computer, uh, computer lessons having, uh, you know, a computer, but we have actually introduced computer labs, yeah, uh, at Kasaya Primary School and at, um, you know, uh, uh, Sankolonga Primary School, we have introduced, uh, you know, uh, computer labs. And the children are so excited. Even those that were shunning going to school have started, uh, you know, uh, coming to school because they've heard that their colleagues are now uh, computer literate. So uh, really, you know, these interventions have helped us while, while the wildlife uh, economy still develops. We have more than 2,000, uh, you know, uh, animals now in uh, Smala that we have introduced. And uh, you know they are reproducing very, very, very well, and the animals are not harmed. So they pass through nicely. You know they pass through. They, they are using the the, um, the connectivity or the link, the wildlife uh, the dispersal area, so effectively, and without uh, you know being uh, you know uh, tempered with by the communities. Why? Because they see the benefits that they are coming from there. So whatever activities that we are doing in Smala. The objective is to conserve the connectivity. And therefore, whatever activities that we do is we link those activities to uh, the, the management and the conservation of the uh, connectivity. So that is a must. So in all these, in Africa, we are saying, or at least in the, the Kaza region, for connectivity to work, uh, the people must be involved from the onset and must be involved at all stages, all stages. Yeah, they must be, there must be joint planning together with them, because even these crops or the interventions that we are coming up, the 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 communities were part and parcel of uh, you know uh, the suggestions, and therefore it is easy for the communities to follow these uh, uh, decisions or the activities without uh, you know, problems. So let's involve uh, communities in our activities, as especially when we want to conserve connectivity. The other you know, uh, lesson learned is that of in, you know, involving other line ministries and other stakeholders, you know, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, uh, Ministry of Fisheries, uh, Ministry of uh, Livestock, uh, Ministry of Community Development, so that we do all these things together. And in the planning of all these, uh, you know, uh, activities, we must bear in mind that we have national development plans. So these activities must speak to uh, the national development plans. Just like the connectivities, yeah, the connectivities or the wildlife dispersal areas that we have set up must speak to the national development plan. Otherwise, someone will plan in somewhere else and come and set up a, you know, a plantation in the middle of uh, you know, a, a wildlife dispersal area or in the middle of a wildlife uh, corridor. So that must be borne in mind. And you know, for Peace Parts Foundation, we do not do things in isolation. We work with governments and we work with communities and they are part and parcel of the decisions the planning, the decisions that we, we make. Finally, I would like to thank uh, you know, uh, the organizers of this uh, uh, webinar uh, for inviting Peace Parks uh, Foundation uh, to uh, make this uh, presentation, and we hope we can be part of your future plans. Thank you so much. So that concludes our case studies. I want to say that uh, thanks to you know our fearless leadership in the World Commission on Protected Areas, Kathy McKinnon, Trevor Sandwith, and others, and for Dave Harmon for helping us with the layout of these guidelines. We have to raise our own resources for this. IUCN is, is supported by its thousands of volunteers, including us. We just want to recognize some of the funders that helped us here. I want to recognize all the authors and all the con consulting people who supported this document. Um, and 
I want to say that this document has been in the month of July only has had 7,000 downloads, um, which is the number one IUCN document uh, being circulated right now online. So we know there's a huge demand for it. Off my own website, I know there were 9,000 downloads. So the appetite for this is great. We're in the process of trying to translate this document both in Spanish and French. And I wanna thank all those who are helping us with that. We'd like to get it into more languages, but we don't have the resources yet to do that, but we hope, we aspire to do that. Next slide. So this wasn't a free, a free lunch uh, or free breakfast or dinner for any of you. We hope that you now will will carry forward. As Jody said, these guidelines are only as good as their use. We don't want it to be a dust collector. We want them to put it, you to put it on, into use in practice, but also, you know, it is a living document and it should be refined. And you can see there are many gaps in the document. And we hope those ga gaps are filled by you because you are the front line of connectivity conservation. So please share the documents wherever you can. We have this presentation as a template for anyone to give it. Last uh, two weeks ago uh, in Colombia, they had a national Colombian workshop on connectivity where Diego Zaretti Shara presented these guidelines to the whole Colombian conservation community. Um, we hope that you will um, um, engage us in learning more and identifying priorities for us and, and other case studies so we can also accrue knowledge. Um, we do, um, we hope that uh, um, um, you will do, you know, you will help us in collecting data uh, about the, the, this work. I did one of the chat um, questions or Q&A questions is, is there going to be, will this information be put in the WDPA, the World Database of Protected Areas? WCMC, the World uh, Conservation Monitoring Center, hopes to have a complementary data set called for area-based commitments of which ecological corridors and hopefully ecological networks will be placed so that you can see how all this fits in around the world. So um, we want to thank you for your participation and now we'll go into question and answers. I've tried to, answer, to do as best I can during the talks. Um, I don't know if I answered everyone's question uh, to the best I can. Um, and uh, uh, let me go, before I go and look at the questions one more time here, sure. I just again want to say that if you have questions that we cannot answer today, please contact any of the uh, corresponding authors. They're listed here, Jody, Annika, Stephen, and myself. If you have questions about becoming involved in the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, please contact Aaron Lars' uh, email there. Um, we want members, we want to support our members, we want our members to be active. We have listed everything we have in terms of resources on the website conservation corridor slash CCSG. And to read the full guidelines, you can do a search on Google and it will come up. Or we do have the web link at the bottom of this uh, slide right now. So going into questions, um, let me see. First of all, uh, of the questions that I answered, I don't know, uh, Anthony Alexander asked a question about, uh, um, the, uh, asked about, about community factors in connectivity. Is, and the question is, is there a consideration to supplement or expand this document further to take stronger account of the challenges and lessons, lear lessons learned regarding uh, potential conflicts or uh, overlap with private uh, interests uh, or community interests within corridors. Would any of the panelists like to answer that? This is, this is Jody, and I would just offer that there are um, uh, a number of different resources, and I believe IUCN even has a, a document about working on across private lands uh, specifically, but I think um, uh, you know, what we've tried to do in this particular document is stay at a very high level that there are ways to work with communities, with specific private landowners and entities, um, but a lot of that information sits necessarily outside the document. That's a good question because every, when you, when you've worked with one community, you've worked with exactly one community. 
um, every community has its own idiosyncrasy. Uh, Blandine asks, uh, do you have any more information on the stakeholder decision tool that was mentioned in the first case study? Yes, I will be happy to share a manuscript and to discuss more if you leave me an email address. Uh, we have a publication where we uh, actually offered options for taking different decisions in order to reduce the development cost for the infrastructure and to mitigate better the, the infrastructure development based on uh, both structural and functional connectivity results to change the route of the linear infrastructure or to this kind of decision. So I will be very happy to share the manuscript and more details if you leave me an email address. And Blandine also asks, uh, regarding the database on ecological connectivity, have you defined criterion with regards to which kind of corridor can be defined as such and then registered in the database. Thanks. Well, we are working with the WCMC to come up with those criteria right now, but a lot of those criteria are developed in the context of conservation. So as Jody said, you know, you have to have a value of connectivity that you have defined. You have to have a process of how you're going to protect it. And then you're going to have to have a process of how you're going to measure it. And so these kind of factors then get put into the database. And then um, as this database is being correct, created, uh, this new area-based commitment database, um, we, will, you know, we will see um, how the uh, submissions come in to determine um, how we can measure the differences between these different forms of, of connectivity conservation protections. Jody, any other additions? Uh, no, I, I think that covers it for now. Thanks, Gary. Nope. Dave asks, uh, opportunity mapping of potential corridors and networks is a good tool to assist decision makers in promoting connectivity. A corollary would be to show where or how much additional connectivity uh, benefits result from removing key pinch point barriers and obstacles to the movement of species and flows of natural processes. To what extent is this latter approach demonstrable uh, with the help of the guidelines. Jody, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I think, um, you know, so what you're saying is, you know, how, uh, how do we show that restoration essentially works? And, and I think there's um, a science component to that, right? So it would be uh, looking at before and after uh, measures and there there have been a number of studies done um, around the world that show that the restoration of connectivity has made a difference um, so um, you know I would definitely encourage you to look at that we we reference a little bit of it in this document but obviously not all of it um, and I think um, you know part of part of what we're encouraging as the CCSG is for all of these different models and approaches to go forward and to continue reporting on it, right? We're, we're, we tried to collect the best available science, um, again, at a higher level, um, but um, we hope that also science continues to advance to, to um, provide evidence to policymakers and practitioners. Um, Adrian, Adrian, who I know very well in Edinburgh, Scotland, asks uh, from the Alliance for Water Stewardship, you know, how can uh, uh, these guidelines mesh with other types of standards like the uh, Alliance for Water Stewardship's International Water Stewardship Standard, and uh, so that we can appeal to different audiences and look for complementarity where we can. And Adrian, yes, I mean, that's, connectivity is, is infused across various realms and in, um, various ways that nature works and certainly in the freshwater community. Um, and in fact, freshwater connectivity is a key part of, of our work. So we have to do better. I mean, we, we are, I guess we, we ask that folks who are from these other sectors who have connectivity elements to their work, we ask how best we can work with you. We don't wanna have a message that doesn't work with your audience. If we can find a way that uh, uh, is, you know, 
works in the context of the audiences that you work with, please let us know. Um, but it is key that we work across all sectors. Any other folks have any comments? Uh, yeah, and I would add to that. I mean, I think that's a great question. And it's also a, we, everyone on this call, all of us, you all um, are part of this. And so if there's a group that's working on something that's interested in how to explore this interconnectivity, the connectivity specialist group is happy to, to help, um, to carry on dialogues, be part of workshops. Um, so feel free to be that connector and that leader. I just want to give a shout out to Khalid and, and Olivier for the nice things they've said. Olivier, you've been part of this document for many years. We thank you for all that you've done for connectivity conservation. Um, let me, well, I'm going through the questions here. Uh, Susan talks about training of communities on connectivity issues would be a good initiative in order to build a basic network on connectivity. Yes, training and capacity is a key element, uh, Susan. I think we need help in, in figuring out how we uh, support practitioners in the use of these guidelines because they are the front line of conservation. And certainly because this is really conservation within uh, much of the human dominated world, you know, it is, it is innovative conservation, it's creative. And this is the new, new area of, of conservation uh, so that we can include all lands and seas in the matrix of, of what we need to uh, conserve. So training is a big part. It is not truly addressed in this document, but we need help from folks. How do we translate this and learn from this in that, in that format? And to that effect, the, the members of the connectivity specialist group, um, anyone who's not a member actually can, act, can actively get um, the, there's a PowerPoint that sort of talks about these guidelines um, and our hope and you know, certainly it's not just um, the, the, the leadership of the CCSG, but it's all the members of the CCSG who can reach out nationally, subnationally, locally um, and, and CCSG is really there as a large community to support this to happen. Um, so if anyone needs help or wants help um, um, in getting out trainings, uh, connecting with policymakers, that's the purpose of the CCSG to help. Uh, Jochen uh, Jaeger, who's uh, uh, from uh, Quebec, has asked uh, how can we add to this topic as you know, we learn more? Um, I, from a personal point of view, Jochen, it's taken so long just to get here. Um, I'm, I'm not ready just yet to have the, the next version out, but we have to do, we have to figure out, this is an evolving field. Um, this is version 1.0, if you will, of the guidelines. We do hope uh, that this is a living document. And I guess we're gonna have in the short term an addenda that will add to this work and then hopefully um, as we go forward, there'll be enough changes to improve the document at some point in the future, but it isn't going to be within the next year. Jody? All right, so uh, what are the options, Rodell asks, what are the options to reconnect protected areas in regions with high human populations carrying their activities through old natural corridors? Well, I mean, uh, I will just say, and I've answered this in the chat before, that there's great work in central India on this work with the central Indian landscape, and they have a site called the Network for Conserving Central India that will you know, present a lot of this with tiger corridors. There's great work in the southeast Brazil where they're trying to reconnect the heavily fragmented southeast rainforest there where only 14% of that rainforest is left, and they're trying to reconnect the fragments there. There are efforts. So, you know, connectivity conservation does have a major restoration element to it. And there are people who are using connectivity for major restoration. Any other co-authors like to answer this? I think there are also really good case studies in urban areas that are looking at connecting communities in, and corridors uh, in urban and peri-urban areas. So, um, look out for those conservationcorridor.org has a lot of case studies to look at. And the uh, case study I right. presented in Spain is actually a great example. It's old roads that are now being protected, partially restored, and they are all in the countryside in urban, through urban areas. 
So that's a great case study there. And Australia has the same situation as Spain with the Drovers um, um, corridors as well. Again, another, another great case study. Um, at, wet, at Wetlands International, we are working closely with the CMS and Ramstar, Ramsar on, um, on various Waterbird flyway site networks. Um, and they're all listed in the chat. Are these flyway networks uh, about connectivity for my, are, as these flyway networks are all about connectivity for migratory water birds across international boundaries and continents, it would be timely to consider including this information in future edition of these guidelines. We agree. You know, as Jody said, we could have done more on the airspaces and in flyways. Um, and we hope that is an area that this vibrant community can contribute and help us with. We do have complementary um, publications coming out, as I said before, from the transport working group. Maybe we should have one, a technical series just on flyways and airspaces. And I hope there is some energy in this community to do that and we can help try to support you. Um, Mark Day says, this webinar was wonderful. Uh, um, what else do you ha have planned from this, in the, uh, from this in the future? Well, as I said before, we do, we're trying to work up the, you know, in the immediate future, we're trying to get the technical guidelines out for linear infrastructure. We're trying to help the World Conservation Monitoring Center build this ecological corridor database. I mean, they are just at the, at the stage of design, but it's not, it's not live yet and we have to help make that live. And that includes the criteria for what is going to be submitted uh, to the database. So that's our, our immediate needs. The Marine Connectivity Working Group is trying to lay out some rules of thumb for marine connectivity. And remember, this is all done at the side of our desk. We all have other day jobs. So we're doing the best we can given our limited resources. But if there are others here who want to step up, I saw someone said they wanted to work on municipalities. Yes, please. It's a whole brand new area. There's some really creative stuff going on out there. We you know we have 920 members. Maybe 10 of you can figure out how to figure out, help us with the flyways. And 10 of you can help us figure out with municipalities. But yes, this is a right field and you know, whatever you can contribute will go forth and, and will help our community as a whole. Um, let's see. Yes, and Lauren says, we look forward to sharing the marine con uh, components more widely. Stay tuned for a webinar on this topic in October. So yes, thank you, Lauren, for, for stepping up right at the right time. So I believe, uh, uh, unless there are other, any other questions, um, and we have two minutes to the hour, um, I believe either I've answered most of your questions in the chat or tried to do my best answering them, or, and the team here has tried to do our best answering them in the open format right now. So again, the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group is all volunteer. It depends on your energy. The guidelines are, are a labor of love for many of us. Thank you for all your help in its production and for your comments. And now we need your help in making them a reality and advancing this work. The appetite for connectivity conservation is great. I want to thank the panelists again and the co-authors and everyone who's participated. And very much, we depend on you to get this work done. We are one big community trying to save the world. And you know, connectivity is connecting nature, but it also connects people. And we're glad to be connected to you. Thank you all for attending this webinar.